Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Parliamentary and Scientific Committee uh, webinar discussion, the first of 2021. Um, I think the participants number has stopped going up, so I think we're all probably present. Uh, it's great to, to be back and uh, to welcome you to this, this meeting. Uh, let's all hope that 2021 is a more uh, positive uh, year than 2020. I'm sure that when New Year's Eve came round, many, many of us were happy to wave goodbye to 2020. Um, and I think uh, there is uh, a lot to look forward to, including a very busy uh, parliamentary and scientific committee program. Um, this evening we are discussing uh, the UK telemedia, ah, the UK telecommunications and infrastructure uh, and I've got three excellent speakers to help us explore that. Um, Dr Ashley Thomas Lenehan uh, who is a fellow at the Centre for International Studies at the London School of Economics. Um, Ashley is also head of policy and engagement at the British Academy of Management. Uh, Ashley, welcome. Uh, Roger Brown, who is uh, CEO and President of uh, and Group Business Operations at Seox. Uh, welcome, Roger. And finally, Dave Essery is, sorry, yes, Dave Essery is Director at uh, Seox Technology Services. I'm going to invite each of my panelists to speak to you for approximately 10 minutes, after which we will then go to questions. Um, and if I, if you would like to ask a question, if I could encourage you to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens in Zoom, rather than the chat, someone can then marshal or, uh, those for me. And when I call your name, you'll be unmuted and able to uh, ask your question uh, directly. Uh, as usual, I'm sure we all know this by now, um, if you're not participating uh, actively, uh, please keep yourself on mute um, and then we should have good sound quality throughout. Right, so um, we will get underway and I'm going to invite uh, Ashley to uh, talk to us for approximately 10 minutes. Ashley. Excellent. Um, can you see my presentation? I can, yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to speak to the Parliamentary and Scientific Committee on the future of telecommunications and national security. Uh, there really is far too much to cover in uh, 10 minutes. So after giving a brief um, overview of the historical role of telecoms in national security, I'm going to focus on the general security risks raised by 5G and then the specific concerns raised by Chinese involvement in Western 5G and in future infrastructures. And given the UK national security and investment bill going through parliament now, I will also look a little bit at why strategic Chinese foreign investment into ICT has raised concern um, because those two issues are closely linked. And at the end, of course, I'll take a brief look at the policy implications and considerations. So now we all know that secure and timely communications have been vital to strategic planning, diplomacy, and military operations throughout history. What has changed, of course, is the speed at which these communications take place, the number of people that can be reached and influenced, and how these telecommunications are sent and secured. We know that the telephone and telegraph change not only personal comms, but also diplomatic and military possibilities and outcome. Radio and TV made instantaneous mass communication possible, changing culture, but also the ability to spread information, propaganda, and other messaging during times of both hot and cold war. So telecoms have played a crucial role in statecraft since World War I, from its use in military uh, intelligence gathering and sharing to its role in shaping alliance relationships more broadly. Wireless capability and the mobile phone were part particularly transformational and their integration with computer technology has cemented telecoms and ICT more broadly as a critical asset for national security. Now, I think it's also important to highlight here that as critical infrastructure, telecoms and other ICT have historically been protected from foreign influence and control in many countries, both Western and non-Western through restrictions on both greenfield and non-greenfield foreign direct investment, as well as through supply chain restrictions and export controls. 
the level of strategic importance is so high that even foreign investments originating from our closest allies and friends have been blocked or mitigated in the past. When there's been concerns over, for example, export control laws, as there was with the Alcatel and Lucent merger, which was probably the most heavily mitigated merger in US history, um, or concern over the future use of component suppliers like Huawei, uh, as with the SoftBank and Sprint deal. So I've included a bunch of examples. We can talk about that in Q&A, um, but I will try to stick to time. So 5G will significantly increase data rates, mobility, reliability, connection density, and area traffic capacity, all while severely decreasing latency and offering the potential for greater security through, for example, authentication or roaming security improvements. Enabling the Internet of Things, it will lead, of course, to a massive increase in the number of connected devices and use cases are going to range from smart cities and grids and smart military bases to factory automation, autonomous vehicles and remote medicine. So all of this will once again transform that relationship between telecoms, ICT and national security, because this increased connectivity is going to affect almost every area of society in the economy. It will reach wider populations and go deeper into every aspect of people's lives. Almost all 5G improvements will be dual use, enabling not only civilian and industrial innovation, but also that of government and military. This has already increased pressure on governments to share or release spectrum previously reserved for military communications, highlighting the need for R&D investment into spectrum sharing technologies, uh, and military equipment that can maneuver between frequencies and across, uh, gain access across the spectrum. So what are the general security risks then that are posed by 5G? Well, on top of the need to maintain the simple physical security of the network, you know, we will have these dense networks of antennas in urban environments, the greatest challenges really are going to be in the area of cybersecurity. So there was a really good uh, GAO report in the US on this a couple of months ago. So I'm gonna highlight and summarize some of the points that they made there. So first, 5G architecture significantly increases the surface area and volume of potential points of attack by both state and non-state threat actors. Greater reliance on software and network virtualization like ORAN increases network flexibility and reduces dependency on purpose-built hardware. But it also means that quality coding constant monitoring, updating, and patching will be required from highly trusted vendors. Similarly, 5G network slicing creates efficiencies, but also the potential for malign actors to attack one slice through the vulnerabilities of another. Continuously connected devices like pacemakers and other medical devices and IoT devices like autonomous cars could also be vulnerable to attack. Another risk is the increased volume and scope of personal data. Um, useful for industry and crime fighting, personal data, unfortunately, can also be leveraged for ransom or worse in the wrong hands. So in addition to basic privacy issues, perhaps more concerning is the improvement, uh, improved capabilities in precision location down to inches or feet, which of course in the wrong hands could endanger personal liberty or security. There's also the quality and security of the component supply chain, the potential for malicious software and built-in backdoor access points, as well as concern over poor quality components, service or future provision of updates and patching, again, all require that countries really trust the vendors at all points in their supply chain. Um, there are also concerns raised, of course, by the fact that many potential 5G security enhancements are optional at the moment. They're often expensive. Um, and they will be uh, implemented by providers and carriers. There will be con uh, continued legacy vulnerabilities as backward compatibility with 4G will be required until core networks are fully upgraded and replaced. And then there's also, of course, the unknown and as yet undiscovered uh, vulnerabilities. So now let's look at all of this uh, specifically in relation to China and 5G. We know that the Primary 5G equipment providers globally are, of course, Huawei, Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, and ZTE. Um, but to understand why Huawei and ZTE have raised specific security concerns, it's really important to look at the context. So first, there's the emergence of China as a near-peer competitor, 
with the potential to overtake, for example, the US economy in the next decade, but also with fundamentally different values on economic freedom, liberal economic order, democracy, personal liberty, and human rights that make it a focal point for concern in the area of ICT influence and control, not just for 5G, but for 6G and beyond. Second, there is Chinese law and policy, which is not a secret, and which gives companies like Huawei and ZTE a distinct competitive advantage. They're heavily subsidized, um, operating in protected markets. But it also makes it difficult to trust that they could not be compelled in the future to comply with requests by the Chinese government. So for example, China's going out strategy encourages and supports, often through heavy financing and subsidies, outward foreign investment from China in strategic sectors like ICT to gain global competitive and technological advantage. And again, I've included some examples here on the slide of strategic investments by Chinese companies in the ICT and semiconductor industries that have been blocked or mitigated on national security concerns. And this is really just to illustrate the breadth of companies that have been targeted, um, many of which have been government contractors in the past or held critical or sensitive technology. And again, I'd be happy to go over these uh, in question and answer, um, but I'm trying to keep to time. So on top of that going out strategy, you also have the last year's China standards 2035 strategy, which again lays out very specific goals for the government's plans to set global standards for the next generation of tech, and of course, the Chinese national intelligence law, which mandates that all companies, organizations, and citizens in China assist in national intelligence collection efforts, and that they must not disclose this, they have to keep it secret, and in return that they will be protected for doing so. And the counterintelligence law, which makes similar requirements uh, for counter espionage. So in this context, it's, kind of easy to see why there have been concerns raised over Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE. You've got a history of attempted uh, purchases of sensitive companies, a lack of transparency, suspected links with the Chinese government and military, as well as repeated charges of industrial espionage, as well as additional just regular espionage uh, from Huawei employees and intellectual property theft, for example, in the US. And then the overall context of Chinese state policy and laws requiring their companies to comply with information requests and engage in espionage activities if they're asked to. So that kind of makes it clear why the US and more recently the UK and a number of other countries have either formally or effectively banned Huawei uh, from their 5G infrastructures going forward or are engaging in rip and replace programs. Um, to summarize, there are some specific risks raised by foreign competitor involvement and investment in domestic 5G infrastructures, and these are kind of clear. Uh, there are concerns over espionage, which of course have implications for intelligence sharing and military operations uh, for countries that use untrusted vendors. There are concerns over intellectual property theft, over the use of data or the provision of supply and maintenance as leverage by foreign actors in the future. Um, concern over the availability of, net, of the network itself, um, you know, concerns over discontinuity or an attack on service or supply in a critical situation. And of course, finally, the concern simply that China might use its influence to lower security standards um, for its own benefit. So what does all of this mean for policy? And I promise this is my last slide. <laughs> uh, well, first, it highlights the importance of maintaining clean telecommunications infrastructure going forward. And that means purchasing equipment, software, and integration services from allied countries or highly trusted partners. It means investing in R&D heavily to ensure a competitive edge in the next generation of ICT infrastructure and technology. And it also means ensuring the UK and its allies have really strong FDI regulations that can protect national security. Uh, this latter point has some specific implications for the UK national security and investment bill that's going through Parliament right now. Um, that bill is very wide in uh, terms of its scope and very good in many ways, um, but it will require, because of the complexity and volume of cases that other countries are seeing, 
in their FDI uh, and national security regimes, it's going to require regularized multi-agency feed-in, adequate staffing from staffers with security clearances in multiple agencies, training and funding. Um, and finally, and this is the last point that I wanted to end on, yes, all of this is important. None of it necessitates engaging in a cold war with China. Um, I think it's very important when having these discussions to remember that China certainly limits inward foreign direct, direct investment into its domestic ICT infrastructure um, and foreign involvement in it. Um, and none of the actions that we're talking about here to protect national security would necessitate stopping or preventing welcome benign Chinese investment or trade in, in any area of the economy. Um, and so that's, that's where I'd like to end. And I hope that that was helpful. Uh, Ashley, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was very helpful. And um, we covered a, a, a lot of ground there, which I'm sure will stimulate some, some good questions. Um, and what one I would like to explore when we get to that point is, it's the nature of 5G and the scale and the connectivity, the points at which you can access it, that creates a greater uh, security issue than current uh, networks. And I think that that's probably not that well understood by a, a wider population. So um, perhaps we could expand on that when we get to, to that point, if that's okay. Great, right. Um, we will move on to our second speaker, which is uh, Roger Brown from Seox. Roger. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, hi. Hi all, um, I'm Roger Brown. Uh, from Seox Technology Services. Um, uh, I am the CEO of, of Seox as well. I hope I'm going to give you a, 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 I see Ashley sort of cross populated over on my funder, but I'm, I'm hoping I'll be able to give you at least a better eye or a, an inclusive idea of, of obviously the mobile uh, infrastructure and what's going on all around it. And also the mobile phones because evolution is happening uh, and it's transforming from where it is today to uh, something even more uh, accessible for for all moving forward, uh, and obviously at present we got 4G, which uh, is supposed to deliver in between 40 and 50, 80 meg um, data transformation. Well, uh, as we know that now, it is hit and miss in some areas, and it, it, and we do have sometimes problems with 4G. The introduction to 5G is slowly starting to come, obviously with uh, some of the issues around Huawei and and the infrastructure that. Uh, some of the the, the big uh, players have already put in. Uh, they've had to now go and revisit some of that infrastructure again to 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 replace it and change it moving forward. Obviously under the guidelines of the government. So that's caused a, a little bit of a, an issue for them um, and has delayed uh, 5G itself. Uh, and obviously the speeds and capability of 5G is uh, in between 300 and 500 meg. I know I've got a 5G phone myself uh, and testing it uh, where I can get 5G. I've got up to, uh, I think it was 390 meg on it, just to give you an idea of the capabilities. Obviously 5G, the way the signal works, it's very directional. So it doesn't go around buildings. Uh, it, it, it actually bounces off of buildings. So the more points they can actually get in, the better the, the actual signal will be uh, and the better the coverage will be for all the consumers and, and people who will be using it moving forward. 5G will be evolution with regards to once it's here, uh, with regards to using the internet, especially in rural areas. Uh, where they can get 5G because it will allow them to be able to um, surf the net a lot a lot quicker. Uh, it will allow them to um, use their phones to obviously hotspot on uh, and, and, and gain better access moving forward. Obviously, with, with the way phones are going, we could see phones have uh, evolved again. They, they, they're now starting with different types of cameras with, with better better quality cameras, um, also with fo uh, foldable uh, screens as well, which is another evolution which is coming along the way at the moment to do with smartphones and being able to access the cloud. So future-wise, um, we got 6G on its way, which is further down the line. Um, from what I believe, the tests of 6G have been uh, 95 gig, 
which is quite extreme. Uh, standard speeds are around, I believe, uh, one gig uh, in between one and 1 1.5. Uh, China have just launched 6G last year, November, uh, which was quite, uh, well, good for the country because they've got high speeds uh, in, in uh, China now. That's the sort of speeds that we'll be getting, and that's the sort of speeds that will help us with ITO, um, IOT, I should say. Uh, IOT, I'll talk a bit more about IOT as we move along. Um, controlling devices, it will help us control more devices. Cars, as you can see, are now using the internet more. Uh, you'll see more vehicles with the internet actually as a standard feature in uh, vehicles. You'll see uh, at the moment you can now use it on the heating in your house, networks um, in your house. Uh, and also for the future, you'll also see uh, the, another type of innovation, especially an innovation that we're working on, is EV units will be using uh, broadband uh, as a hotspot as well. So uh, with regards to the mobile phone technology, it will, evolution will come. It will be swift. Yes, uh, as Ashley said, there is a, a, an issue around security and around um, ac accessibility, uh, which is something I know some of the, uh, the big mobile companies are working on. The other part of the evolution uh, for us is uh, there is going to be a merger of uh, networks with BTO2, E, Vodafone and Free. Uh, that's still on the cards. I know they're still working on the contract on how that will work for all uh, five companies uh, moving forward, uh, which will give us uh, even better flexibility and more evolution for us uh, in the long term. So that's about mobile phone technology and, and what, what's going to happen for the future. There is still uh, lots of talk about uh, different types of uh, phones. So phones where you can use more accessibility for the cloud. Uh, phones will become more accessible uh, as a laptop rather, or a smaller laptop rather than bringing your own laptop with you. And it will be, uh, there'll be more smart type uh, phones that can use uh, slightly similar applications to what you use with your laptop uh, and make it more accessible to actually access the data because you are still restricted at the moment to access certain data from your mobile phone. So that's the piece about the mobile phone technology. I hope um, I've covered, I, what I try to do is cover as, as much as I can um, with regards to the mobile phone side. So I wanted to talk about IoT um, and the description in um, um, uh, Wikipedia is, um, uh, it describes it as network, physical objects, things that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with devices and systems and the internet. What does that actually mean? It means like how you use your, your smart TVs at home, Sky TV, it, uh, mobile phones, Sonys, laptops, tablets, uh, music systems, clocks, Apple devices, alarm systems, radio, um, uh, accessing devices from out and it allows basically companies to be able to access systems in your house um, for uh, maybe a service, a vehicle service, there might be uh, where the car's connecting to, the, to, to your house internet or, or connecting uh, outside. I know my car connects outside and they tell me when my car needs a service every now and again. Um, the type of bandwidth IoT needs today is in between 250 meg in the house and 500 meg. Um, give you an example of uh, IoT. I've got 61 items in my house which uses my network. Um, when I spoke to uh, uh, Virgin, who's my provider, Virgin told me that I had too many items using my my network at, the, at any one time. However, when you're looking at, you've got Sky, you've got mobile phones, your, mom, uh, your wife's got a mobile phone, the kids have got a mobile phone, which is accessing uh, the, the network as well. You've got smart TVs, you've got laptops, you've got um, Sonys devices, which are accessing it, and they're all using data from that particular uh, network. And, and if the network can't withstand the amount of, um, the data what's being uh, transformed there and back, then that's going to cause obviously the consumer even more problems. 
what's what's for the future is um, obviously there's going to be more devices um, using IoT. There was a concern that uh, some of the major companies like Cisco, Microsoft, IBM, and Amazon uh, raised around security. However, uh, they are now looking at uh, using uh, the facility of blockchain um, to cater for that facility. Uh, blockchain is basically a, a it's a, the best way to describe blockchain is it's like a, um, data being spread over several different that's digital data being spread over several different locations um, uh, to make up one piece of data so uh, I'm not sure if I'm describing it right it's like a web basically um, it, it, dis it disperses um, and probably, I'm sure Ashley will probably be able to correct me on this, but it disperses uh, when you purchase, say, a, 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 if you purchase a bit of music, uh, this will actually prevent music from being copied and, 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 and obviously uh, reproduced and, and given to somebody else as well, as well as movies, because you, as you can see, I know you, Sony announced last uh, this year that they're going to be obviously um, streaming all their blockbusters via their new streaming app moving forward and that's part of blockchain as well because blockchain will prevent people from copying and uh, duplicating that particular piece of music or film and that's me i hope i i know it's a bit iffy but i hope that gave you a, a fair idea of iot and uh, a mobile phone technology. Dave's got probably uh, a better even, because he's much more technical than me, so he'll be able to give you a bit of an idea of the other side. Roger, thank you very much uh, indeed. Very interesting. Um, and you're obviously very well connected with your 61 items at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, it, it, it's interesting, and one of the questions I'd like you to think about uh, when we come to the questions is, um, if, you, if we're moving to 6G and some of the extraordinary speeds you mentioned uh, in your presentation, um, one is how, when is that likely to be hitting the UK if we've yet to really roll out 5G at any scale? And secondly, would it then make it pointless to be investing at this point in broadband and full fiber networks if you're gonna end up with uh, you know, full coverage of 6G across the UK? But I'll let you ponder that one and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, and when, so before we do that, um, I'm now going to invite our next speaker, which is Dave uh, Essery, again from Seox. Uh, uh, Dave, can you give us uh, your thoughts on this? Hey, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Roger and, and Ashley. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to thank everyone for the opportunity to uh, present today. I'm just going to give a broad overview of, of broadband and Wi-Fi technologies. Um, so broadband today, um, the, the market now for broadband is a major part of the UK telco industry and currently reaches 82% uh, of the UK's population. And the term broadband covers both fixed and mobile services. So the fixed being the cable, and that will be what we used to know as ADSL and the, the broadband services that, that we've all got at home uh, and the, the router there. A mobile, that mo mobile broadband services, that refers to, to the 4G and now the 5G uh, services that are being launched in the UK by the mobile providers. So just a li little bit of history. Um, Broadband is relatively new service launched in 2000. And at the time, it, the speeds were limited to 512 kilobits per second. Today, we're looking at, at fiber, fiber to premise services that are running at one gigabit, a thousand megabits. So that's almost 2000 times the bandwidth that we had when broadband was launched back in 2000. We see a big, big step change around 2008 where there was a hundred, well, one and a half million connections were actually implemented. And then in 2009, we saw, we actually saw a big, big increase as well with over 50% of households having access to the broadband services. 
So in the UK, there's predominantly three types of broadband connectivity, those being end-to-end -end copper. So that's basically the, the legacy telephone uh, infrastructure that was in place. This is limited due to the limitations of copper and, and transmission on that. You're limited to, to really a maximum of around about 30 megabits per second on those services. And we've, we've recently seen the rollout of what's called FTTC, and this is fiber to the cabinet. So around your local communities, your towns and villages, you'll see these green boxes that have popped up, generally with an open reach van outside. And this is where the fiber is provided from the local exchange, the local uh, open reach network connection. From, from the green um, cabinet, that back to your property or the business office will be carried on, on the existing copper solution. So FTTC is, is effectively a hybrid, mixed of copper from the premise to, to the fiber from the cabinet back to the exchange. Then finally, we've got what's called FTTP, and this is fiber to the premise. So this is rolling out at the moment by open reach, and this is effectively a fiber connection direct from the exchange in the network, direct to the premise. So the demand for bandwidth has been growing exponentially, it's particularly with, with uh, the streaming services over the last few years with, with Netflix and Amazon Prime. Also gaming service as well. There's been a, been a, a steep increase in gaming with not, not only PC gaming, but the, the consoles with PS, the, the PlayStations and the Xbox. There was a increase with social media as well and uh, the, the streaming that, that, that comes with that as well. And almost recently with the, the, the pandemic is homeschooling. There's been a large demand for access um, to the bandwidth in the infrastructure uh, for teaching purposes. Some of the challenges around broadband is pretty much is, is giving that access to, to everyone in the UK. Um, the, the troublesome areas really being rural and remote locations where the cost of running cables out to those locations is, has been pretty much cost prohibitive. And a lot of the providers are concentrated in the, the high population areas where they can get, get a higher return on the investment. So the current future of broadband, well, OpenReach have announced a, a 15 billion pound program to roll out their fiber to the premise, one gigabit per second services. There's currently around three and a half million connections and OpenReach are targeting another 3.2 million connections by the mid 2020s. And also the government announced recently before, before Christmas their, their five billion pound gigabit broadband plan. And this will prioritize homes and businesses who have limited or no access to those. So those on, on very low bandwidth or, or no access at all uh, will be prior, prioritized in the delivery of that service. We'll also see continued deployment of 5G services. I think over the next few years, um, that, that deployment is, is gonna, increase, providing uh, phenomenal speeds to um, the mobile providers, to the, to the consumer, those with, with smart devices that can use those facilities. Well, so as well, we're seeing deployment of low orbit satellite services. So if anyone's seen that SpaceX have, have launched their Starlink service, which are the, sometimes you see them going across the night sky, it's a train of satellites low orbiting, and they will be providing uh, uh, access to internet services via that service. Also the company called OneWeb as well in the UK uh, due to launch their services soon. Um, SpaceX, I think are around, have launched between 600 and 800 satellites already. And they're aiming for around about 40,000 satellites that will orbit the earth providing that service. And expected speeds will be around about 80 megabits per second for that. Uh, and this will supplement any the coverage that will be provided by the fiber infrastructure and the 5G infrastructure as well. Okay, so move on to just a little bit about the Wi-Fi. Now, Wi-Fi, that provides a network 
networking of devices and access to the internet wirelessly. And I think we've, we've probably all got wireless facilities in our, in our home and we use Wi-Fi in some way, whether that be in the home, office, shops, coffee bars, restaurants. Um, in 2019 alone, over 3 billion Wi-Fi enabled devices were shipped globally. Um, it's almost one, one device per two people on the planet. And this includes phones, tablets, PCs, laptops, TVs, printers, audio devices, drones, and, and Roger mentioned as well, cars. Uh, so almost everything, everything being built today will have a, a facility to be able to talk wirelessly um, across, across the network. The benefits of Wi-Fi, access and, and availability, uh, where you can just walk into to an office and connect direct to those facilities. And also the flexibility as well. So there's no, no cables needed on that. We'll see there's cost benefits as well and the speed, speed of deployment. And rather than flood wiring a location, you can use one or two access points that can provide that coverage uh, to your user community or, or in a house as well. Obviously, disadvantages, and, and Ashley covered some of this, is, is security. You know, at the end of the day, is Wi-Fi is open, and you have to put your, your own security around that. But that, that is improving as the, as the technology is rolled out. Uh, another disadvantage is inter interference of the service as well. So it can be impacted by an electromagnetic interference, so lifts and lights can, can cause problems. Um, I've had a problem at home recently where, where one of my speakers works wirelessly and has, has been bleeding over my signal and causing problems for, for the kids. And uh, you can imagine the, the trouble that causes when they can't access their internet services. Also, speed up until now has, has been um, an issue as well because you're, you're actually... So many devices today talk on those Wi-Fi frequencies that sometimes the speed can reduce and you don't always get the, the speed that you get on a directly connected wired connection. So just a little, about, a little bit about the future. Uh, technology and performance is improving all the time. So Wi-Fi 6 is the newest technology that's coming along and that's going to be running at around about 3 gigabits per second. Um, and both Ashley and Roger have mentioned IoT. With that, there's going to be significant growth in Wi-Fi enabled devices. That's, that's just going to, going to increase. And there, there'll be a significant growth in apps that utilize Wi-Fi technology as well. So, and just my final, final point is that this will all seamlessly integrate with the fixed and mobile services and, and we're getting to a position where we, we will have a, an always connected internet service uh, as these technologies get rolled off, rolled out across the infrastructure. That's me finished. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, some very interesting uh, points in there. But point I'd just like to ask is talking about the Wi-Fi um, issue. And an ever increasing number of devices trying to use Wi-Fi. Um, is, is there a way around that? Do you just increase the the footprint and the the points at which Wi-Fi is accessible to to improve that? And the other bit was you mentioned about security of Wi-Fi. Is it the Wi-Fi itself that is insecure, or is it the devices that are connecting to it? And actually, if you improve the security of the devices, you could then have open Wi-Fi. That, you know, I suppose, you know, acts as the road along which everyone else then travels from a secure point to a secure point. Is that? Really so I, think, I think on the, on the coverage side of things, um, you can you can increase the coverage by putting in more access points in a, in a building. And there's a lot more intelligence built in the, the access points today, so they can they can stop any bleed over between those access points as well, and they can move move around the channels. So today, uh, we, we use two channels, 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz. So we're increasing the number of channels. I mean, I'm, at home, I've got, I've got several broadband 
services and Wi-Fi. So every now and again, I have to just tweak the channels and move them around so to avoid the chatter. But uh, as the technology improves, these devices actually talk and, and stop the, the bleed over themselves. But, you know, today, the, a lot of TVs, remote controls, you know, almost every device today is becoming Wi-Fi enabled, Bluetooth, and they all, they all chatter on that 2.4 gigahertz. So I think it, it is getting a bit more problematic, certainly in my house where we've got tablets and phones, all the kids are connected, TVs connected. Yeah. Um, and, and with regards to security, I'm, I've come from a, a background of fixed, fixed networks for, for big corporates. And we've always deemed that a network, as soon as that data leaves your building, it's insecure. So the best thing to do is always secure that data before it, before it leaves the building. There's a lot more technology coming along today. And if you see adverts for VPNs on your phone in particular as well, where you can set up encrypted, effectively an encrypted tunnel from your device to what you're talking to. So no one can actually snoop on that. But, you know, Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. There'll always be someone out there trying to, trying to crack that. Okay, thank you. Ashley, I think you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, I mean, just on... On the security of devices that are connected to, you know, the future and now Internet of Things, I think part of the issue is that a lot of the devices that will be connected aren't necessarily going to be capable of the kind of encrypted security that we would wish to see to prevent, you know, hackers using them as a way of gaining entrance into other devices that are connected to them. Um, and also the fact that, you know, I mean, we're talking about, for example, Roomba vacuum cleaners that are connected to the Wi-Fi, but some of them actually you talk to and are listening. So they're connected, you know, they're connected, but they're also collecting personal data, right? Smart refrigerators collect personal data and information. And so part of the issue about this, you asked before about the surface area of potential attack is that, you know, aside from the issues with virtualization, which we can talk about, there's, just so many entry points of attack, even in an individual home. I mean, Roger mentioned how many devices he had. So you'll have billions of devices on these networks. And I think while we can incentivize carriers in you know, the UK and the US and other places to adopt and take on those security enhancements that are possible in 5G, I'm not sure that we can get every Fitbit device to do that or incentivize, you know, every every small company that makes something that's going to connect to a, a wireless home in the future. And those products are also not we're not going to be able to control where those products come from. So, you know, I can buy a device from China on Amazon easily and I, you know, you're not going to be able to prevent those from coming into the network. So, I think that's something that has to be considered. What, does that mean, therefore, that the network is only se as secure as the weakest link on it? Because if that's the, the potential access point that someone could hack into, I mean, I, I visited the National Cyber Security Centre just after it opened and they were demonstrating a vacuum cleaner that was uh, had a, a camera built into it for whatever reason that was streaming live back to the factory in um, China, um, a doll that could be hacked into that you could get to speak to open and activate your smart devices. Um, how if, I, I suppose how, did we all have to take some personal responsibility for our, for the, the wider security of moving to an internet of things? Well, I think that, you know, there's an issue of you having to take personal security for, you know, what you bring into your home and, and how you handle security in your home, but, and I'm hoping that Dave and, and Roger will correct me if I'm wrong because they're the experts on this. But when it comes to securing the core 5G network, you know, that, that while there will be vulnerable points of attack that can come through those areas, I think there are many things that countries can do, um, you know, with software, but also constant monitoring and constant updating. Um, and constant security patches. And so that's one of the reasons I highlighted the importance of ensuring that, you know, your vendors for that core, and it's very difficult to distinguish between the core and edge network as you, you know, move to an ORAN system with yeah. virtualization of the radio access network. So 
you, you want to ensure that those you know, infrastructure suppliers are trusted vendors so that you can at least sure that the patching and the monitoring is happening in a way that you're happy with and that you can trust. Because I, I don't think any central government is going to be able to fully do it on their own. They're going to have to rely on providers. They're going to have to rely on carriers and they're going to have to rely on partners at, at all ends of the spectrum. Thank you. Um, Roger, did you want to say anything on that point? No, I, I quite agree with what Ashley said. I mean, there's, you know, especially working. So, so one of the, 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 the items I actually done uh, in my past um, role was uh, launch EE's 4G network uh, uh, working when I was working for T systems and I was the program director for that. Uh, and um, looking at how we, we implemented such a large scale project to join two organizations, T-Mobile and Orange together, to be able to launch EE as a, as a company and also as uh, their 4G uh, flagship product was hugely complex, uh, to say the least, because joining up the networks, and some of their vulnerabilities, because no, no two networks are the same. No two networks has the same sort of patch levels to them. Uh, it was quite, it was a huge challenge, an absolute huge challenge. So yes, uh, you know, some of these companies do need to take responsibility. Some of these companies, I think there should be uh, some sort of legislation, if I was to be honest, to be able to manage these, these companies to make sure that they do have the, uh, the right patching, the right security, um fixes to be able to to stop some of the because the more we prevent the the less uh it, it becomes and and it becomes it doesn't become the norm it becomes a distant uh something quite distant um but there's still a long way to go to get to that particular level and i'm sure dave can probably uh um uh, touch on that point as well I, I agree. I agree with Roger, and I think, uh, I mean, there are certain industries, certainly financial services. They, they have part of their operating licenses to make sure that everything in their estate is secure, and, and patched, and that there are no vulnerabilities. So, they spend hundreds of millions of pounds a year ensuring that their infrastructures are secure to to protect the money. Um, and I think across some other industries, it, it would probably be useful to bring that, that in as well. Uh, you're muted, yeah, Steve. Thank you. You'd think I'd know now after doing this for a year. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. Anyway, we now have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, and so the first one um, I'm going to go to is... Paul Jackson, uh, can we unmute Paul? I think I'm now unmuted. Do I get a reaction? Yes. <laughs> um, a couple of things I'd like to ask about. Um, uh, on the sensitivity to, to China, uh, I have a concern that we might get away from global standards if we're not careful. And the great advantage that we've had from GSM onwards is global standards. That means that we've had access to cheap telecoms, cheap cellular, um, it's been a wonderful thing. Uh, there is a risk that we go away from that. And I wonder whether industrial espionage is such a problem now in the sense that some of those Chinese companies are kind of ahead. Would they want to, get to have espionage on some dud technology to in implement rather than uh, forging their own way? Um, in some areas they probably are. And on the trusted vendors and countries, this troubles me a bit as well. If I was going to tr choose some trusted vendors, I'd probably think of um, companies like Boeing, Volkswagen. Uh, and it turns out that in software, Boeing's had some real issues, really serious issues. Volkswagen, um, actually, they were cheating on, on emissions. So in terms of trusted countries and trusted vendors, yeah, I wonder whether it's as simple as we would, uh, would hope it could be. And I remember some of the discussion around when the first fly-by-wire aircraft were, were being launched, the A320s, and we were worried about software integrity. Now, that didn't actually get to be a problem at that stage, but everything is now software dominated. Do we need to have a better mechanism than just the kind of geography 
in how we approach the networks and how we approach software integrity. Is that just a bit too crude? And could we have a, another VW emission scandal in telecoms Absolutely. if we're not careful? Thank you, Paul. Um, who would like to take that? Um, Ashley, yep, please. Um, so a, a couple of things I think that those are really great questions um, and very important ones. Uh, uh, on the global standards issues, I mean, for 3D security enhan enhancements um, in the 3G PP partnership, um, I'm sure I'm getting the acronym wrong because <laughs> there are so many acronyms to remember. Um, but, you know, in terms of the global standards for 5G security, China has been extremely active. Um, I think they want to set security standards for, you know, not just 5G, but also 6G. Uh, you know, they launched a 6G satellite supposedly in November. Uh, I think it is important for the NATO allied countries in 5G, just as in everything else, to really step up their involvement in global standard setting bodies um, and, and start getting even more involved than they already are. Um, and, and again, this is because, and this is not just about geography and, and pure alliance relationships, but you know, in, in terms of the broader liberal economic order and, and standard settings, there has been a lot of pushback from China on what we would consider kind of liberal standards and, and high security standards. And so I, I think that's an area where we do actually need to play a, a really big role if we wanna see the kind of security domestically that we expect. And also that our militaries will need because a lot of government uh, you know, systems will be on 5G. Uh, military bases may have their own secure you know, 5G setups, but at the end of the day, their personnel are still gonna go home and use the you know civilian infrastructure uh so it, that that is something that needs to be considered in terms of industrial espionage um you know <laughs> maybe on in certain areas of technology yes you know china has taken some intellectual property and run with it in far advance beyond us in other areas they're ahead of us completely on their own and and that is wonderful for China, um, but I think the issue goes beyond industrial espionage. And, and what that example shows is the ability to use this technology uh, to engage in espionage period. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, while we may not care if they take some patents on some things, we might really care if they start taking patterns around, you know, highly critical and sensitive source code for the Ministry of Defense or highly critical systems for uh, NATO fighter aircraft. So I, we kind of have to think again, a little more broadly than some of those cases. Um, and on the trust or ish, uh, vendors uh, question, I completely agree with you. You know, it is, you can't just accept that because a company is coming from an allied country or a trusted country that it's going to be up to standard and up to snuff. I mean, one of the reasons I included the, those cases um, at the beginning of, you know, foreign direct investments that have been blocked on national security grounds from allies is because there have been real concerns, you know, over certain companies who have gauged or flouted export control laws, for example, selling, uh, technology to Iran that we that we wouldn't want not want um, and other issues similar to that. So it, it is going to be very important that your trusted vendors are not just you know sourced on the basis of geography. I think the reason why China becomes a bit of a bugaboo and something that we have to really think about going forward, specifically for ICT infrastructure, is this issue of their own domestic laws and stated policy because it's not a secret that they're trying to compete with us on this issue and that they very happily use this technology to engage in espionage to their advantage. And I think the national security law and the actions recently in Hong Kong, you know, the actions against Jack Ma and activity in the South China Sea shows that a willingness to use intelligence and surveillance in a very certain way. Um, that we have to be cognizant of and aware of going forward. So that's that's the only thing I'd suggest, but completely agree with you, can't just be geographic. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if 
anyone wants to add to that, it's not necessary. Um, we'll move on to our next question. Now, I missed a question pop in from our president, uh, Lord Brewers. Lord, uh, Alec, you there? You're still uh, that's I'm it. mute. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like uh, our speakers, and I congratulate them on excellent presentations, uh, to comment on the NVIDIA takeover of ARM, or the proposed NVIDIA takeover of ARM. If you look at the way the world's working at the moment, the USA was able to really uh, harness uh, or tie down Huawei by denying them uh, Qualcomm chips. Um, the world is very vulnerable at the moment because uh, uh, Taiwan makes the most competitive chips uh, and uh, even more competitive than Intel's. But it worries us because uh, a lot of us who have been in the semiconductor business and, and the rest of this business, you see, while we had ARM, we've got the number one chip design company in the world. Uh, it gave us a real card to play in international negotiations. So what, what do you think about this? I mean, it's being discussed by the monopoly people at the moment, I guess, but what's your view? Who would like to go first on that? It's probably one more for, for Ashley, really. Sorry, Ashley. <laughs> um, okay. I didn't want to dominate uh, <laughs> part of the discussion. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the ARM NVIDIA deal is uh, highly complex and, and complicated, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer it now, but always happy to continue to carry that conversation on later. Um, I, again, there have been many deals throughout history between allies that have been heavily mitigated. There are ways to have that deal go forward and still keep the technology in the UK, um, keep the actual you know, facilities in the UK um, and really only have, for example, the finances surfacing up to, to the acquiring body, whether it's an American one or another. Um, so I, I think everything that I've seen in terms of the security concerns around NVIDIA taking over ARM from the UK perspective, I would say can be mitigated and probably should be because I don't think you want to see ARM being taken over um, by an actor that you'd have even more difficulties with mitigating that to, 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 um, to the UK's satisfaction. So um, I, I don't know if that will or can happen, but that would be my personal take on what could probably be done. I think what makes ARM NVIDIA so interesting is that in the first place there was allowed to be an ARM China JV created with, you know, manufacturing actually in China, which makes it highly possible that the Chinese will try to block the deal on the grounds of their own national security. And that that could be possible, and and I think that that's going to be tricky and interesting to see how that plays out, um, because they do you know ha have the right to do so technically. Um, so there's a lot more going on than just um, the U.S. purchasing of that that company. So and I you think we're we're dealing with it all right. I mean, personally, and I, again, I, I don't have a UK security clearance, so, you know, <laughs> you have to take this with a grain of salt. Um, but from the outside perspective and my history of looking at deals that have been mitigated, I mean, Alcatel-Lucent, you know, that merger was able to happen. Um, the US wasn't hugely happy about it. It was the most heavily mitigated deal in history, including an evergreen clause, which allowed the US government at any point to re reverse the merger if they were unhappy with the security agreement that was signed. So, you know, those types of heavily mitigated deals between allies are possible. Um, so I think it, it, it could happen. Um, what I think is gonna be tricky and what is gonna be interesting to see play out is how the ARM China JV is handled. Um, and and that, that will be kind of a separate set of issues that, that need to be dealt with. Thank you. Does that answer? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, so 
I'm going to go to our next question. So if we can have tight questions and uh, quite tight answers as well, and then we'll get through uh, as many questions as we can. Uh, next question is Paul Monks. And then I'm going to invite William Duncan. So uh, Paul. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm, I've been very interested and in, in challenged by, by this seminar. I'm very interested in in the challenge for the NS and I bill, national security and investment bill, and, and the level of expertise that one is going to have to have to judge these embedded technologies. So I, I'd really like the panels. Uh, I'm, I'm really challenged by the 66 items. I've just counted the number I've got in my home, and I think I thought he's got a lot. Then I started counting. I thought, oh no, I've got just as many as that. Uh, so 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 how how do we do something like that, and particularly in the context of the NS and I bill? Great. Who would like? Again, it's pro probably not not one for me. I, I'm. It's not my um, field of expertise that, that area. I'm not, so I don't know if, if Ashley there. I'm um, yeah, yeah, hanging over to Ashley enough. for a bit. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, no, well, I, I do have strong feelings on the bill, so I, I'm happy to answer it. Um, you know, I I think w one of the things. Um, every time I've been asked to talk about that bill that, that I keep repeating is the importance of multi-agency or multi-department feed-in um, to the, the, I mean, I think the lead agency is going to be Bayes and there will be supposedly, you know, depending on who you listen to, around 100 staffers within Bayes and their unit that will be acting as the repository body, kind of like as the Treasury does in the US with CIF, the Committee on Foreign Intelligence or foreign investments in the United States, sorry, CFIUS. Um, and it's important to have a lead agency and that's very good. But I think the one thing that the CFIUS model does show and has shown consistently over history is the importance of having not just ad hoc feed in, but staffers in you know, intelligence agencies, defense agencies, um, different areas of the economy, you know, so energy, for example, all kind of constantly monitoring and looking out for potential investments that could be of harm, as well as consistently giving their advice, you know, as and when it's needed from a security cleared, uh, you know, perspective. Um, and, and that has proven important in US history. Uh, you know, they've got kind of the biggest case log of this going. And we have seen a number of cases where things were spotted after the fact even with this and they had to be retroactively um, reversed or to have forced divestitures. So, you know, the example that always sticks out in my mind is Huawei's purchase of the bankrupt assets of Three Leaf Systems, which, you know, was a cloud computing uh, company. It had government contracts and it went bankrupt. And that at the time didn't fall under CFIUS regulation and Huawei bought the assets. and. Surprise, surprise, you know, a, a member of the government figured it out a year later on LinkedIn um, <laughs> by looking and seeing that their former friend who worked for three or who I think was one of the founders of Three Leaf was now a consultant for Huawei. Um, so, you know, that, but he was constantly monitoring and looking and, and looking for those kind of things. So it was able to be reversed. Um, the most recent US legislation, FIRMA, actually provides massive funding for new staffers in each of the, you know, I think we're now up to 13 bodies that in different ways feed into CFIUS. Um, because, including undersecretary positions, because what they've realized over the last couple of years is that the complexity of cases, and it's not surprising given what we're talking about with 5G, and the volume of investments in these areas is rising so rapidly that they really just need the staffing and, and that constant feed in. So my recommendation for the, the, the national security bill, the national investment and security bill would be to ensure that it's got the right institutions behind it. Um, and that that's really written into the process uh, and, and that it's not ad hoc. Thank you. No, I think that's uh, sound advice. Um, so next we will go to William Duncan and then, um, because I think your William's question is to Ashley as well. Uh, and then to give Ashley a quick break, I'm going to change the order around and go to Tony Whitehead, who wants to ask about uh, the 
um, Internet of Things, which perhaps uh, Dave or Roger uh, might like to take. Um, William, fire away. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my question, which I will keep brief because time is now short, is uh, to Ashley about how does the present machinery of government within the UK affect how policy choices are made in this area? And the supplementary to that is, uh, what improvements would you like to see made? And perhaps if I could also add, how does this compare with how other countries are wrestling with the same problem? End of questions. Yeah, no. you, <laughs> they're all excellent questions. I mean, you know, the arm video question, this question, they're all so, so good and so important. Um, I, I think I would go back I would pass the foreign investment in security, you know, the, the national security and investment bill. Um, I, I would pass that, make sure that it has the institutions behind it. You know, personally, I would amend it to have those institutions written in and that feed in writ, written in. Um, I, if it was me, <laughs> uh, I would maybe limit it to actually foreign investment because right now it isn't. And I think otherwise the volume of transactions that are gonna go before Bayes in, in that swath of, um, of sectors that require uh, mandatory notices is going to be dramatically higher than they expect. Um, so, you know, limit, limit the scope a little bit uh, in that sense to just foreign actors, make sure that you have that institutional feed in. That's very important. That is machinery of government. Um, I think I would increase staffing across every government department so that there are staffers on this issue. Um, I would train them up. I would make sure that there are the databases that they need um, to track investments. I would make sure that they have the access that they need. I would make sure they know not only their other points of contact in government, but also the points of contact among their uh, allied countries. So one of the things that we've seen in a lot of foreign investment um, regulations and changes that have been made across Europe, uh, the US, and including in the UK bill is are these provisions for intelligence uh, coordination and sharing on this issue. And I think that's really gonna be difficult if there aren't consistent points of contact. Uh, on the machinery of government front, I'd also try to ensure that people stay in this post for more than the kind of normal government um, civil service six month period. I mean, I know when, when this was a white paper issue and I kind of met the national security team at Bayes who were fantastic, but they kept rotating every six months and from the outside trying to follow just who was in charge of this was massively <laughs> difficult um, from within the country. So it, it is important that again, for machinery of government, that people stay in these posts at least for long enough to get up to speed and to build relationships with, with those in other countries who, who don't rotate as often. Um, I think that's really important. Thank you very much, Ashley. Right. Um, and as I said, I'm going to go to Tony Whitehead first and then uh, Neil Gaspar. And we've got about six minutes. So uh, if we can now keep the the questions and the answers quite tight. We may be able to get through everyone who's submitted a question. Uh, Tony. Right. Um, I'm just thinking against the background where there was a, a lot of anxiety about smart meters and public rejection of smart meters. And at the moment, some people are running around burning down 5G masts. I wonder if somebody is looking at the future public acceptability of all this intimate connectivity. And I was quite alarmed, Stephen, by the suggestion that I could buy a vacuum cleaner that had a camera on it. Um, you know, is, is I'm, am I going to get a phone call from Beijing from somebody telling me that I've missed a bit? <laughs> I think if it only it was that um, benign um, would be my concern. Um, Roger or Dave, do you want to comment on public attitudes towards uh, technology? Uh, its adoption, and I assume that the, the burning of 5G masks is all to do with the conspiracy theory around that 5G gives you coronavirus. Um, yeah, I, uh, Dave, was you going to? I was going to say, uh, I, don't, I don't think everybody actually realises um, what uh, IoT is in terms of what's coming and what's already here at present because it's only when you start looking deeper into you, what you use today 
and what you understand is being i mean to be fair the 61 items that i uh have got you know in the house which is using it i didn't even know they was using it that was that's 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 how interesting it actually was it was only when i had problems with my uh broadband with virgin and i was saying this is just dropping out it's not you know everything's just it's just chaos you know i bought a service to the uh, and and then uh, when they started looking at it they said well you've got too many too many items connected to it it's it's you know it's it's not made to cope with that and that's them saying to me it's not made to cope with that now if it's not made to cope with that what are they doing behind the scenes well i know they're doing something because that's the whole idea of them bringing in one gig uh, to as many households as possible but, but for the consumer, they don't know. When they buy an item, uh, you know, just like you said, a vacuum cleaner, come into the house and then it, it wants to go onto the internet and it, it, it goes on to the, to the free Wi-Fi or, or whatever the case may be, you know, we're, we're not fully aware of what's going on. So these things are talking, talking to different things outside of our houses uh, and we're not aware of it at all. So yeah, it's, it, for me, um, and this is just my own opinion. I don't believe that the consumer understands what's going on. Um, the companies do, and they know what's going on, and they're trying to battle that before it hits the consumer, and they all start to realise, and they all start to realise that, you know, this is costing them so much money, uh, but they're not getting value for, for money with their, what they're actually buying from the, the internet providers. So, it's yeah, it's a bit of a, an interesting one. You're muted. Thank you. Does anyone know if any research towards public attitudes uh, to this new technology have been undertaken? I'm not aware of any uh, at the moment. I think it's it's something that's almost been it's happening behind the scenes and no one's realising that it's no. happening. Okay. Well, uh, then, if anyone's listening and fancies doing a bit, oh, Ashley. Yeah, well, it's slightly different. I mean, there is research in the US going on on, for example, the health effects of 5G, because obviously, I mean, there's been some concern over, you know, high band frequency, because there's low frequency and high frequency in mid spectrum 5G, then there have been cons some concerns because we don't really know and haven't used high spectrum as much as will be in the future. Um, I think there's both government and civilian res uh, research going on on that issue. I can send that offline if you're interested. That would be very helpful. Thank you. All right, right. Um, Neil, running out of time, but uh, Neil Gaspar. Good evening. Can someone wave if you can hear me? Excellent. Hi. So uh, my question's for Ashley, really. Thank you for your talk. and. Um, Thank you for the picture of Telstar. My late father-in-law worked on that uh, some time ago. That's great. Um, I was thinking about uh, secure timing because we're um, incredibly reliant on GNSS and GPSS for time signals as well as navigation, but time is really important for cyber security and telecoms and things like that. I really like to hear what you, what you think about whether 5G and 6G are resilient to that, or whether we should be uh, doing more for secure timing to support it, or whether 5G and 6G could su support secure time to other areas? That is an excellent question, um, and one that I admit I do not know the answer to. Um, I, you know, I've, I've read a fair bit on GPS and 5G and, and some of the security concerns around that, um, but I haven't come across the time question before, but if um, someone can arrange for me to have your email address, I will find out for you. Thank you. Please do pass on my email address to her. Thank you very much. I fear I've, I've had instructions to end this at 6.45, which is where we are uh, now. So I fear that there are a few people who haven't been able to ask their questions and for uh, that I apologize. But I think it's been a very interesting uh, discussion uh, this evening. Um, I particularly want to thank our three speakers, uh, Ashley, Roger and Dave. Thank you for your insights into this very, very important area. Um, it does sound like we do need generally to do a bit more of public awareness raising and uh, increase the, the uh, amount of understanding there is around 
uh, this technology and how it how it works. Um, oh, sorry, someone's just posted a comment saying that time the time question is very high on the agenda, which is is good. Um, so thank you all three of you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, can I thank our audience and our questioners and particularly thank the Parliamentary and Scientific Committee team, which is uh, Lee Jeffs, uh, John Slater, Karen Smith, uh, Ben Allen, and uh, for their part in organizing this event, and Charlotte Hall, who will be writing up uh, the, uh, the coverage of this, which will then be published in our Science in Parliament magazine at some point in the future. So uh, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, our next discussion is taking place on the morning of Monday the 1st of February at 11 a.m. and it's in partnership with the Royal Society and we will be looking at the theme of what does the UK EU deal mean for science, the sort of re recurring topic that we've looked at over a number of years about the impact of Brexit uh, on science and so I'm sure that will be a very interesting uh, event so anyone who wants to sign up for that please please do um, thank you again for your attendance I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and I will see you all again very soon thank you bye-bye <laughs>